So you could literally hear a pin drop at the end. Oh, of really? Spell. It was fantastic. Oh, cool. I, I, it really sounded like everybody had a good time. Yeah. Yes? Woo! Glad you liked it. And it's such a, it's such a fantastic feeling, actually. You know, to, to, the change in the atmosphere in, in a screening that really is connecting is really wonderful. I mean, you've been traveling all over the place with this, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. have been, yeah. I mean, it's the whole reason you make a movie is because whenever you feel like that in a, in a, uh, seeing a movie, you, want, you just want to do the same if you can. Mm. And one of the reasons why I'm mentioning you as soon as I can is because we want you to come in um, with questions because uh, we've been talking uh, outside and just saying how you've been doing a lot of publicity and lots and lots of questions. But the really curious, weird, quirky, very, very specific ones have all come from the audience. So, yeah. my God, we already have one in the audience already. We don't care where they come from, what they are. Yeah. What the, he doesn't mind. He will do them all in the voice of Crush. He has promised, if that's something somebody's uh, interested in. So I want to just kick off with a couple of questions. And then, as I said, we really do. We've got about sort of 15, 20 minutes we want to get in. And we want as many people with their questions. So hands in the air. We have two mics, OK? Uh, okay, give me one second. God, they're anxious. This is what it was it's like. Good. I like it. They were like literally like waiting. It. When are they coming back? Eager. Eager. I know, it's fantastic. Right, so first question. And I'm kind of curious about this because in, in Finding Nemo, Alison Janey is in it. And I absolutely love her. I think she's one of the great actors. But she seems to be always kind of like the supporting actor. She's the perfect person who comes in and makes everyone look brilliant. Right. And I kind of thought the same about Dory. So I was really curious about how you moved what seemed to be a, a really amazing supporting character and you kind of pushed her into the light. Do you know what I mean? You kind of pushed her under the spotlight and said, here you go, you're going to have an entire movie named after you. How, how did you, you know, get to that point? The only re reason we dared do that is because uh, of two things. One, I knew she had issues that were unresolved from the first movie, so there was uh, almost a main character's worth of stuff to talk about. With that, that's really hard to find for a story in general, so to have that kind of given to you on a plate, that's a bad analogy with fish, but yeah, to get, just yeah. give it to you Like is, a fine piece of sushi. <laughs> yeah, um, but also, I had known all along, writing her in the first movie, that she had wandered the ocean her entire youth, and didn't know why and where she was from, and that frankly, her friendliness, her optimism, her caretakingness, was actually her armor. It was, it was her attempt that maybe when I meet another fish, they won't leave me if I'm that helpful, if I'm that friendly. So I always saw her as a tragic character, even though everybody else saw her as a comic character. And the mistake I made when we were starting to write the film this time was even the crew didn't know that. Yeah, right? it was like I think we made at our first or after our first or second screening because we we screened this movie uh, about nine times uh, through the course of making all it. The rough um, drafts. All yeah. the rough drafts. So it was, I think it was the second version. We were sitting in the story room and it, we were like, God, you know, it's really hard to to kind of get the audience behind Dory and why she wants to find her family and what what's really driving it. And um, you know, Andrew, out of, I think in frustration, was out like, of anger. He was like. Well, but she's been by herself for like her whole life, wandering the ocean and getting rejected and people forgetting her. And literally the entire story team was like, what? <laughs> and he was like, no, 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 that's, but that's her whole backstory. That's, I have, that, that's what the whole reason I wrote her in the first place. And we were like, that would have been really nice to know like a year ago. Um, so then that's, I think, that's when we That's when we realized we have to put it in the film because nobody yeah. saw her the way I had always seen her. So that was always kind of there. And then tell me about the importance of, of Hank, which I think is kind of crucial, because he pulls things out of her that, that, that she would maybe be able to reveal herself because of her natural kind of personality. Yeah, Hank came out of, I think, our first or second draft from our writer, Victoria Strauss. She realized that Dory, it, it, Dory plays best when she has somebody to work against yeah. because she was built to be a side character. So she, wasn't, she doesn't really work well solo, particularly also with her short-term memory loss. So to give her, she said basically, give him a surrogate Marlin. Give him somebody else that's grumpy that makes her like, want to throw her optimism on him. And physically, how do you get a fish around a man-made institution that's in and out of water? The most ambulatory, amazing uh, creature that is actually a, an escape artist in real life is an octopus. So that it's was really- Criminally underused in cinema. Uh, right? There's a really well, there's bad a reason James for that. Bond film and that's it. Really. There's a reason for that. They're incredibly difficult to build and animate. 
But uh, Hank was probably by far a character that that almost broke the studio. He was an independent movie cost-wise uh, yeah. uh, himself. <laughs> Literally, and the, he, and the that's first, why he only has seven tentacles. The we were first like, we shot. cannot afford an eighth tentacle. We can't do it. That's such a producer that was my thing. one producer Andrew, you can have an octopus right with seven legs. Seven and, is all we can do. And the first, one of the first shots we did with an animator where you see him in quarantine, and he, it's a long two-shot, two and he's trying to like pickpocket her tag twice. It took six months to animate. We had our own rap Whoa. party. We had our own rap party after months. that was done. Yeah, the learning curve got better. But he, he it, it's funny when I watched it. I, I kept thinking in my head. I mean, I know it's Ed O'Neill, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the sort of cast. But it was Walter Matthau was in my head. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely. Really such a Walter Matthau character. Yeah, just grumpy, this kind of wants no grumpy part of guy, it. you know. Yeah, yet that you know underneath is a heart of gold. Yeah, yeah. but it's going to take a long time. Yes. Like, and somebody like Dory. Yes. Yeah, to actually pull it out of them. Um, we, when, when I was kind of fascinated, because I, I don't want to ask you the question about pressure, but there is something about somebody who has a very strong connection to the huge success that was Nemo, constantly talking on her you know, nationally syndicated chat show that she wants a sequel. That's more than somebody just saying, listen, you know, don't forget me. I mean... Yeah. I think that somebody asked her, like, oh, what were, the, what were the emails like? And Ellen was like, that you sent to Andrew and asking for a sequel, and she was like, email? I have a nationally syndicated talk show. <laughs> I didn't waste email. email. Yeah. And it was true. She did, I think it was about once every you know, couple months, she would make some joke about the fact that the only sequel Hollywood seems totally unprepared to make was finding a sequel to Finding Nemo. But the truth is, I, I laughed it off and ignored it, because um, you know I've done enough, this is film 17, we've done enough of them to know that if it's, we're gonna spend four years with whatever this idea is, and it's gotta be great. It's gotta, it, it's gotta be, not, it, or it's gotta get to being great. In other words, you gotta know the right place to dig, and if, and if it's not worth, if you can't sense that there's something that's worth digging for four years, where three of those years, guaranteed, is gonna just be miserable. It's just not gonna be nice. And what's gonna get you out of bed at the end of year three into the last year and still face the day? No, no amount of pressure from Ellen was going to make me go there until I had an idea, you know, that was I felt was worthy to do that for. So I was uh, saying to Andrew earlier that um, there's a wonderful story that Nick Hornby, um, who who did screen for Brooklyn, he said that he was kind of bored writing novels and sitting on his own in his house, and he said, right, I'll do a screenplay, and he did the screenplay for Wild, and he met pretty much everybody at the premiere, and he had two phone calls. And that his experience of working you know, on, on that particular type of film was basically still isolation on a script that then he sent off and everybody else. It's completely different working in the Pixar yeah. Yeah. sort of family, isn't it? It's completely different. Can you just it's, talk it's, a tiny bit about if that? If anybody's done theater, it's much more similar to workshopping a play, um, but even more extreme. We start with a blank page with like a germ of an idea, and then we invite everybody in over our shoulder while we just do our really horrible first draft, our really horrible second draft, and, it, and, and keep putting on really bad versions of the play for years. So, I mean, like Nemo was 12 drafts yeah. and, and about 10 times of putting on the play, and uh, Wally was about eight, and uh, this, was nine. this was nine. I mean, but we, it, but we screened it, I mean, if you include the kind of executive screenings down at Disney, we screened it about 10 times. We, when it was, you know, in the process. It's yeah. still fresh for us to think of this movie as something that's good and works, because we've spent three and a half years with a movie that's really not worth showing anybody, <laughs> and so it's 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 humbling. And a lot of people telling us that. Yeah, and it's every every day, yeah. <laughs> so it's 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 um, but in a weird way, it works because the environment that we created Pixar, we've we've had it since the beginning when we were small. We just learned to propagate it. it it's much more like a film school atmosphere where you all feel like you're learning. You don't feel like you're all professionals that know what you're doing. You're all just trying to, because hopefully the next film you're working on, it's got something about it, or the story is something you've never done before. And everybody just wants it to be great. And uh, it, it's not, and you try to hire people and surround yourself with people and, and foster an atmosphere where the best idea wins. It doesn't matter who. And it doesn't matter if you keep losing the arguments. It's just that you were there in the arguments helping find that third answer that would have never occurred if you'd not debated it. So I, if, in a weird way, we like we train like great debate teams, yeah. film debate teams, you know, yeah, yeah, so. And I'm just, we are gonna come to you in about, literally about two seconds. I have just a personal 
question because I absolutely thought the casting Diane Keaton as as Dory's mother was brilliant. I thought that was absolutely stunning. I thought this is so clever because it makes so much sense in my head. Did it make sense in anyone else's head? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, some people said. Okay. Working with Diane Keaton. Oh. Well, the re I mean, if you've ever seen Ellen's talk show, whenever Diane Keaton is on Ellen's talk show, their relationship is hilarious. And so that's really, I mean, aside from just loving Diane Keaton, I mean, as we thought about Dory's parents, it, I mean, I think there was, it was about three seconds before we all kind of mutually said out loud, like, oh, it needs to be Diane Keaton, yeah. um, and who has never done a voice um, before in a movie um, uh, for animation. So she was, it was the first time she, she had done it, and she, she is... She came to know. every recording session dressed as if I there mean, was going to be a Vogue shoot, like a Vogue cover shoot. <laughs> Seersucker suit, white bowler belt, hat, white lace boots, gloves. Oh. hat, oh, it nails was were polka dot. <laughs> She'd always be like, oh, this thing. She's like, oh, stop, you've seen this before. <laughs> Great. She, she was, was hilarious. She was fantastic. Because the two, the, there were two things. I mean, one is is the, the casting of the voice and the talent. It's, it's really, really special in, in, in Pixar films as well as the actual story. And so I'm interested in, in that choice, but also the music. I mean, it's 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 really wonderful because it's reminiscent, but it's it's quite quite yeah. different in, in, in lots of ways. Tom Newman is basically a cast member in my mind. I, I wrote the first movie uh, with two very specific talents in mind uh, when I was writing it was that Ellen DeGeneres had to be Dory and that Tom Newman had to do the music. And I only listened to his music, uh, well that's not true, I only listened to his music and then when I was on Dark Moods I listened to Nine Inch Nails, The Fragile. But other than that, those two things I would listen to all the time and by the time I was finished writing, I, it was, his music was just a character in the movie for me. And so uh, I don't, I can't imagine if it would have worked without him. And so he's a cast member. Like this movie didn't feel like it was fully working right. until he scored it. And and like, I, I, as a producer, it's hard to lose Andrew for a day to go down and meet with a composer, especially when it's far out. We can't afford the time and everything. But it was, it's kind of the opposite with Tom in a weird way. We uh, we were always looking for opportunities to get Andrew and Tom together because when they sit together and talk. Um, there's something about both of their personalities that um, makes the other one have to be very specific about what they mean. Like and when Andrew says, well, I want this to feel kind of like this is the engine. It's the beginning. He said, then when you say engine, do you mean like you want it to actually feel melodically like repetitive? Like it's ramping? And then they will spend, I'm not kidding you, like 45 minutes debating the word like engine and what that means to each one of them. And then at the end, they all go, okay, I know what you mean. And then we go back to, the, to, to Pixar, and, and then I sit and I listen to Andrew talk about that same scene um, that I've heard him talk about for months, to the animators, for instance, and the way he will talk about it will be so different having had that conversation with Tom Newman about music. He's my um, therapist. He's basically it's my just, cinematic and it, but therapist. It also, it just, it, but it makes you think about something totally differently and have to explain yourself in a way you haven't had to explain yourself before. You use different vocabulary, and we fall into those kind of habits of using the same vocabulary, and Tom um, kind of just doesn't let you get away with it. I mean, he kind of is, it's pretty, it's pretty special. And is he on board from the beginning? Hopefully. Uh, we, we usually try yes, to give him a heads up, so because he's a busy man, that, so that when, because we can pretty much tell him what months yeah. we'll need him. So. And we gave him a lot of grief on this one because there was a few times when we were like, ooh, Tom, you're getting your Bond on. Because he had just finished like two, because he had finished two Bond films like right before and you can like, doom, doom, he's like Peruvian Pan Pipers like with Hank going down that thing. It sounded a lot like Bond. Right, let's get some of these, these hands in the air and these questions out. So we have one over here in green. He's in the hey. third row, he's got a question. Oh, we're gonna get you a mic. Your mic Hold on right one there. second. Here you go. Will there be uh, another Finding Nemo? Andrew? The, no the yes, number Andrew. one question we have had as we've toured the world for the last five months is, is could there be a Finding Hank, right? Yeah, and then our joke in response to that is I think you're gonna have to do Finding Andrew first. Yeah. <laughs> it's, eight years, um, it's a long, it's, it's hard to think about the next one. Maybe. There might be, there might be. How old are you? Eight. Eight? See, if I started today, you'd be 12 when I finished. 
you think you'd still want it? Would when you you're still 12? want it by then? Okay. Oh, okay. Well, well then. Then I'll have to think down. really seriously about it. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's a world-breaking exclusive. Yeah. And then we've got one at the back. Uh, me? Yeah. Uh, my question's for Andrew. So, when you were studying to be a director, did you... So, how long have you been working with Pixar? Uh, 27 years. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so, oh, Jesus. <laughs> okay, so... Um, how old are you? How old are you? I'm 13. Okay. Okay. Got a while. So what chose you to pick Disney Pixar out of all the others? Oh, I wish I could say I chose them. I really do. But the truth is, is that they chose me. And, uh, and I spent many years uh, wandering the desert of unemployment, uh, wishing I could work for Disney. Didn't you apply to Disney? I applied to Disney three times in three years, and they turned me down every time. Um, and uh, it, it, the truth is, is that, you know, the best advice I can give you is that nobody can stop you from creating. You don't need permission to do that. And you live in a wonderful time that I didn't get to where you have a whole movie making machine in your pocket, or maybe you do if your parents are nice, you have a phone. <laughs> and you can make movies whenever you want. And you can keep doing it, and you can make bad ones, and you can do it until you make good ones, and you can have a means to show it to the world without anybody telling you no. And that's pretty amazing, because that's not the world I grew up in. And it's only because I made some student films and I had them showing at a festival, and a guy named John Lasseter saw them, but didn't call me for another four years until he suddenly had a position where he could hire somebody. So you never know when somebody's gonna see your stuff and when somebody's gonna call you. So all my advice is just keep creating and keep making sure people see it. Yep, so I guess, I guess you'd be kind of more important, because you're an inspiration which makes these fo which makes these movie making apps and stuff. So you're kind of an inspiration for that to begin in the first place. I, I um okay I'll take it for yep. sure. Yep. And then P.S. I seen two one thirteen on Dory's tab. Ah well you know there's it's in two other places. It's two other places. You know, I can tell you because you've seen the film. Uh, it's on the license plate of the moving truck. And then the really yeah. tricky one is when Fluke and Rudder both say their ailments and they lift up their tails. Nasal one parasite, tag, anemia. Yeah, one says A1 and the other one says 13. Oh. Ah. You can be the first to blog that. Question up the back. Hi, the last question was far better than mine, I think. And um, there's such a theme of disability in this film, from Dory to Nemo's Finn to Hank's missing tentacle, and historically when we look at disability in film, it's harshly critiqued. There isn't a very good track record of the treatment of it. Were you anyway nervous in putting a film out that where it's so central? I really wanted to make my left foot with fish. That was my <laughs> desire. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think so. I mean, I think, you know, what was, what was really interesting is, in a weird way, a lot of times when you create these characters, their character and their behavior becomes them. And, um, and so Dory kind of lived on beyond Finding Nemo for, you know, before we started this film, for eight years. And somehow, in some way, the way she was written and the way Ellen performed her and the way animators animated her, she kind of became a bit of a poster child for this kind of just keep swimming kind of optimistic attitude. And then, you know, as we started going back in to work on her character, we realized, you know, she never once mentions Nemo's fin. Um, the only person she actually ever apologizes for ever is herself uh, at the beginning of the film. And, and that was actually the whole reason we wanted to make the film, was so that she would stop apologizing for herself. And, um, you know, so part of it was putting kind of characters around her based on the, the kind of facility, the that, that she came from that kind of helped illustrate that a bit too. Not overtly, but just kind of that all kind of struggled with whatever it was that they felt was a flaw. And we could see that she didn't, she looked right past it. She just refused to see that and, or define them by that. And, um, and, and it just kind of made sense. It wasn't the, it wasn't the you know, kind of the overt um, message of the story, but it made a lot of sense and it always felt true to her that that's how she would react in any situation um, when confronted with those new friends. In a weird way, we inherited a character with a disability and had to address it. And so very quickly, I forgot about that issue. 
and I went deeper to just what's the universal thing about this that everybody can relate to and the truth is nobody's perfect it's just I think a disability is a more obvious sort of setback or handicap for people but we all have something about ourselves the way we think the, or the way that we have difficulty processing things or the way we express ourselves or if the gamut is huge uh, that we think is a setback or a flaw, but it actually turns out if you, as you get older or as you get more experience, it's, it's the thing that makes you unique. And, it's what, and, you, and when you learn to embrace that and accept exactly your specific thumbprint and have confidence on that, um, the more um, at peace you are in your independence. You know? And that's that the universal thing I was looking for that speaks to wonderfully to disability, but it speaks to everything. And the other thing we debated probably a lot was how do we, how do we want the parents we, we actually did talk a lot about how we wanted the parents, how we wanted to get the message across. Oh, Dory's parents. Dory's how parents. Dory's parents were dealing with her as a little kid. And that kind of took a lot of different forms and we, that we kept kind of coming back to them wanting to try to, you know, like you do as a parent, you try to teach these lessons and you have no idea which ones are gonna stick. And then, and then you're always kind of surprised at the ones that do and so that kind of was, what we kept coming back to is like, all right, how do we kind of illustrate them trying to do in a lovely way, teach her something that they're hoping is gonna stay. That, that's why as know? a parent, my favorite flashback is the very last one because it's, it's confirmation that Dory did hear it and it just finally came out later, much later in life than they thought. And uh, that's your, oh God, is that your hope as a parent? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and in the middle, we've now we've only got time for literally three, so we're gonna have to ask you to, uh, okay. Or we can give really short answers and we can keep moving. Yeah, we could just yeah, stop short, short questions. Mind. Okay, into the into the middle, and then if you can just take that one up on the up, up on that the back on the second, I think it's the second one from the back, and then we'll come down in the middle. Yep, um, up we go. So finding Dory was obviously huge, and there were a generation of children for whom it was one of their favorite childhood movies. Um, Nemo, Finding Nemo. Sorry, Finding Nemo, yeah. Um, but obviously a lot of time has passed in between when that was released and, and when they were kids. And now, and obviously this movie, there's an entire generation of kids this is new for, but there are also an entire generation of grown-up kids who, who still remember Finding Nemo so fondly. So what was it like for you knowing that there would also be that kind of target audience eagerly awaiting Finding Dory? And did that um, change how you approached it? It was a very strange feeling because you kind of knew everybody was going to come no matter what you did, you know, in, in a weird way. It's like it could have been black leader that said Finding Dory and people at least shown up and, to yeah. see what it was. And then booed. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was strange. It was strange to know there was a, we called them Generation Nemo. And uh, it was, it's strange. I mean, my kids are Generation Nemo. They're in their 20s now and they were raised with Finding Nemo and stuff and so. It's, um, it's fascinating. Um, I, I, I honestly didn't think about it too much. Um, there's so many things that could trip you up thinking like that, and I think what I tried very quickly to do was just try to get in the same headspace that I did with Nemo, when nobody knew about this film, and nobody knew anything I was doing, and there wasn't a right or a wrong choice to pick any of these characters, and try to be in the exact same headspace, and just go, I gotta give this, if, if this has any chance of being feeling and, and seeming like the first one, it's gotta have the same environment where nobody's out there, this, the first movie never existed, and I'm just doing whatever is right for Dory for the story. And so that's kind of, in a weird way, I just had to ignore everything. Out of all the characters in Finding Dory, who would be your favorite? Crush! <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, what was your fee? I love Bailey. I love Bailey. I, I, I think part, he just makes me laugh. Um, I think there's something so kind of charming <laughs> about Bailey. I don't know. And I love, I just love that he's like this like quiet cheerleader for destiny on the side. I don't know. He, yeah. every, I, maybe it's because I love Ty Burrell. I, I think just every session we had with Ty, I laughed and it, and it, it just made, put a smile on my face. Becky cracks me up. Um, <laughs> Who doesn't like a crazy chicken? And, yeah. Uh, um, uh, probably Hank, because we spent so much time with him. He's sort of the Dory of this story. He's sort of the, the ultimate sidekick of this story. So I think I've spent the most trench time with him. So, but it's hard to choose. I like them all. I like the loudmouth clam. That's also, also Andrew, in case so. you're wondering. He's really annoying. 
I think we've got a final question here. Come on, Finn. Um, congratulations on the movie. And um, how did you pick the voice actors for the characters? Well, the, you know, it was, as we laugh, we say, you know, there's something really nice about doing a sequel to a very uh, successful film because it turns out your phone calls get returned um, a lot more uh, the second time around. But we... Um, you we, can tell what television shows we were watching. Yeah, we love Modern Family. Obviously, we were watching that. Always um, Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah. Yeah, and The Wire, yeah, which Wire. is a very odd choice, and you sh children should not watch Never that. Never watched it. Um, but uh, yeah, we kind of did. It was um, honestly like a wish list of it was. of people that we, whose voices were just so great. But when we choose them, what we usually do is we find a clip of something they've done in a movie, like a little, and we we. And we take a picture that we have an artist do of the character, like like say the seals or something, and we, or I mean the sea lions, and we just look at the picture and just listen to the sound of that movie clip of that person and see if it matches. It's like casting without them knowing we're doing it. <laughs> and, uh, and it works, it works really well. Okay, I think uh, one more person. Okay, yes, go on. bold hand go in the on. middle. Um, well, I I might be wrong on this one, but I heard you that you directed Toy Story. Is that true? I was one of the writers of Toy Story. Oh well, um, I yeah, I heard forget it. Yeah, I never mind. Forget it. Like, like, another question. question. <laughs> I'm talking to the wrong guy. No, but like, I have another question. Um, I heard that uh, I heard somewhere that um, the voice, the original voice for Nemo in Finding Nemo had a cameo in Finding Dory. And I was just w I was just wondering because I kind of forgot his name. So Alexander Gould. Gould. Yeah. Oh yeah. But um, I, I just saw it on the um, uh, credits. I was he a passenger car or? He was. What, there was two people in the moving van that were driving the truck that uh, that Hank took over with yeah. Dory. And there's the woman and there's the skinny man. He's the skinny man. Oh, because I had an idea yeah. that that was him. Okay, well done. This is good. We, we, this could be a convention, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can come back tomorrow morning, nine o'clock, and we're going to go through it again. Yeah, yeah. We got a lot more to say. So we, um, we'd like to thank you all for coming. We have to do a very special presentation. So is everybody okay to stay in your seats for a couple of minutes? Okay. Um, I'm going to read something out because it's probably easier if I read it out because it will keep all the kind of um, uh, titles and, and all the important information in it. Um, we would like to mark this very special event with a presentation of our Festival Tribute Award. Our Volta Awards are named after Ireland's first dedicated cinema, the Volta Picture House, which was on Mary Street, and which was opened on the 20th of December 1909. And uh, this award has been um, bestowed upon a number of uh, sort of international members of the filmmaking community, including Al Pacino, Martin Sheen, Daniel De Lewis, Danny DeVito, Julie Andrews. And it's presented to filmmakers who we feel have made a major contribution to world filmmaking. And uh, as you can possibly guess, we're going to make uh, this presentation to Andrew tonight. Um, I had. A, you know, numerous ways that I thought, you know, we could do it, but actually what I'd like to do is just read you out a list of the films that this man has been involved with. Because in a way it feels like, you know, the the sort of my sort of childhood on screen and it, it's just a wonderful list. So you've mentioned that you started off in, in, in Cal Arts where you did the student films, you joined Pixar in 1990 where you became the second animator and ninth employee to join the company's elite group of computer animation pioneers. As vice president creative, he leads the initiatives and, uh, and oversees all features and shorts developments of the studio. Stanton wrote and directed the Academy Award winning feature and much loved classic Wally, for which he received an Oscar nomination for best original screenplay. He made his directorial debut with the record shattering Finding Nemo, an original story of his which he also co-wrote and the film garnered two Academy Award nominations and Finding Nemo was awarded an Oscar for Best Animated Feature of 2003, the first honor uh, that a Pixar film uh, received for a full-length feature. One of the four screenwriters, to answer somebody's question up there, to receive an Oscar nomination for his contribution to Toy Story. 
He went on to receive credit as a screenwriter on every subsequent Pixar film. Now here goes. A Bugs Life, Toy Story 2, Monsters Inc. and Finding Nemo. Additionally, he served as co-director on A Bugs Life and was the executive producer on Monsters Inc., Monsters University, Ratatouille, Brave and last year's The Good Dinosaur. In addition to his animation work, as mentioned before, he made his live action writing and directorial debut with John Carter. On a personal note, I'd like to say that I have long admired the intellectual curiosity and ambition of his work, which has created an indelible impression on world cinema and for Irish audiences and for many, many people in the future. A provocateur, an innovator and an artist, the Dublin International Film Festival is proud to, to celebrate both Finding Dory and your career in cinema and present you with this Volta. First off, it's beautiful. I love... I love that I can turn red in a country where that's normal. Oh, man, it's... It, 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 that, I don't know where to... You know, all that came to mind hearing this... I don't know if a lot of people know this, but I, I grew up in a really small little fishing village in the North New England uh, area of the United States. And, um, and every summer, the Swedish dance hall got turned into a movie theater for three months. And it was uh, run by a, B, a retired B-movie producer from Hollywood who had, still had his distribution connections and would get these scratched up art house prints from movies that were successful two years earlier. <laughs> and he would bring them out and show them every three nights. And it was one of my first jobs. It was like my own little cinema paradiso. And so I would spend the weekdays watching my brilliant career or my left foot, or I mean, no, not that, that was much later. I mean like um, uh, my brilliant career, uh, Tin Drum, uh, Magic Flute, Night of the Shooting Stars, just these films that uh, you literally did have to pay me to watch. And, uh, and I would see them three times a night. And, and then on the weekends, I'd be racing to go see Star Wars or Raiders of the Lost Ark or all these big blockbusters. And I really feel like it was that that gave me the, I don't know, what it is I strive for whenever I get the chance to be part of a movie which is these small movies are so essential to film. They're, they're, they are, they, they are, a, they capture just such life affirming things and that's the point of them. And the blockbusters are such an escape but in the best sense. And I always felt, I remember when I was starting to make Nemo and I was having a little bit of influence, I said, could I, wow, all we do is make blockbusters but could we, could we make that be actually a, a life-affirming indie movie in sheep's blockbuster clothing, you know, with Find Nemo. And that was my goal, was to like make that. And I think it's been my goal ever since. And so this really, I, I take as an affirmation that somehow that maybe got it through or is getting across. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please give a huge welcome, or a huge goodbye, actually, to Andrew and Lindsay. Woo!